Um, <clears throat> so, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, transition watch points in the sense of um, if you have, uh, have a debugger, you've seen uh, there's this feature called watch points. It's very uh, commonly used, for example, in GDB. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, the idea is some debuggers already have watch points, some don't. Some that do have watch points, they don't really implement them very efficiently anyway. So we have a new way to uh, implement them. Uh, this is using uh, uh, an, uh, a checkpointing uh, program that uh, my team has been working on for over 10 years. It's widely used now. Uh, so this is checkpointing in the sense of systems. I'm coming from a systems group myself. Uh, so we can take a, 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 pro, a process running uh, and we can transparently save that running process from RAM down into a file and then we start it later. And so when I talk about checkpoint, I'm going to be, going to be talking about saving the entire running process. In fact, we're going to be doing a little better than that. We're going to be saving the uh, application process and the debugger that is operating on the application process. And that debugger could be a built-in debugger, uh, uh, like many of the functional languages have. It could be a separate process like GDB. In all cases, we just save the entire running state of everything that's running uh, into a file, and then we can bring it back later. So let's talk about that. So uh, we have, uh, here are some common debuggers. Uh, and uh, everybody pretty much has step in, over, and out, uh, breakpoints, even conditional breakpoints are very common. Um, in our case, we also want to support multi-threaded programs. Multi-threaded programs are more and more important all the time. Uh, the trouble with debugging multi-threaded programs is that you end up with these uh, non-deterministic bugs. Sometimes you see the bugs, sometimes you don't. It's a race condition. It depends on what order the threads ran in. Um, GDB has a feature that helps to try to isolate it, scheduler locking. Um, in any case, on top of some of these features, we're going to uh, be using a deterministic replay. Uh, we have our own uh, deterministic replay that we did in-house, but it's nothing special. It could easily be substituted by any of the very good deterministic replay programs that are available out there. So now let's go to that uh, next topic, value watch points. Um, so, um, in fact, first I'll go to re uh, reverse mode. So what we're going to show is a reversible debugger, and uh, once we have the reversibility built in, then we're going to be able to build this idea of transition watch points on top of it. Uh, reversible debuggers are uh, recent, but they're not completely new. So, for example, GDB has had a reversibility mode for some years now, and there are various experimental packages that offer reversible debugging. So instead of step forward, you can now step backwards. Instead of finish the function, you can reverse back to when the function started, things like that. So uh, now that we imagine that that exists as a tool, let's see what we can build on top of that. So uh, now let's come to watch points. So watch points uh, are not the first thing that you would teach undergraduates when you're teaching them how to use debuggers, but they can be very valuable. Um, especially when we're talking about multi-threaded programs. In a multi-threaded program, one thread can change something in memory. Another thread tries to use that memory and gets an unexpected result. How would you debug this? Um, at this point, breakpoints are probably not the right solution. You would want to put a watch point on that memory location. And now, if any thread ever tries to change the value at that memory location, the debugger should stop and, and show you that this value has changed. So some debuggers have support for this. Uh, GDB is very good at it. Uh, but they're restricted primarily to something called value watch points. The idea is they can give you a watch point on one location in memory, and therefore one value. Uh, and they can do it efficiently. They have their hardware support for that. But sometimes you don't want to have a watch point on a value, but actually a more general expression. For example, suppose your application is operating on a graph. And the graph 
graph is supposed to be connected, and then you have a mysterious error, and you find out it's because the graph is no longer connected. Now I would like to set a watch point on, is the graph, is the graph still connected? Well, that's more difficult. In principle, in GDB, they have a generalization that would allow you to uh, set a watch point and constantly execute your own function testing is the graph still connected. But you would never want to use that because what GDB would do is on every single instruction, it would proceed to test the entire graph to see is it still connected. And if your uh, program takes even a few minutes to run, that's many billions of instructions. You don't want to test is it connected billions of times. So, let, uh, so I'll show you what our idea is for transition watch points in which you don't have to evaluate that expression billions of times. We'll just evaluate it a logarithmic number of times. So in this case, the logarithm base two of a few billion. So first, a reminder that reversibility uh, exists. Um, as uh, GDP is probably the most accessible place where you'll find it. If you want to see it, just type help reverse in GDB and it'll ask you which one of the reverse commands that you actually want to use. And I guess the names make it obvious what they do. Uh, the diagram also up there, I hope, makes it quite obvious uh, what each of the reverse commands do. It, it's very intuitive. It just goes backwards in time uh, along the same lines that you would normally go forward in time. So, for example, here, there is a break point that existed in the past, so reverse continue would go backwards until you can find the last break point. Um, so uh, these types of reversibility debuggers exist. Um, we happened to build our own because we wanted that foundation on which to build these watch points. So what we did is we decided we wanted to build a language agnostic reversible debugger. It should not depend on any language. Uh, each programmer has their own favorite language and even their own favorite debugger. And so our idea is let's support whatever your favorite debugger is. It should not be our job to tell you what language you want to use. So uh, there, I guess in the literature there are four flavors of reversible debuggers right now. We don't have time for a survey, but I think the names give you something of the idea. Uh, so for example, GDB would use record, reverse, execute. Uh, in, in our case, we're using uh, the, the checkpoint uh, re-execute version, or actually checkpoint deterministic re-execute. Um, and uh, our reversible debugger, we call it FRED, fast reversible debugger. Uh, so in any case, the, the main point is we're going to build this as an overlay on top of the application process and on top of the debugger itself. Um, so, uh, and in each overlay, you can implement it very easily. For us, we find about 100 lines of Python is enough to build the overlay in your favorite language. Um, and then the reason for this is essentially we take uh, things like step, next, finish, continue as primitive debugging commands that are understood by most debuggers. And our 100 lines of Python uh, just tries to detect special commands like this and then pass them into the debugger. So it's nothing more really than uh, a, a bit of parsing. And if it ever detects a reverse command, then it does something special. Um, so what would it do that's special? Well, let's take the example of reverse, uh, reverse next. So in reverse next, um, so as I said, our system is built on top of something that can checkpoint uh, all of your working memory, all of the processes that you're operating on. So the way we would do a reverse next is we would go back to the last checkpoint, maybe far on the left, far be before the screen, and then we'd execute forward so many times until we finally come to one before the current time. And so that, that's the way we would do it. And uh, if that takes too much time, we can always add more checkpoints to make, make it more efficient. Okay, so here's the architecture that we have. Ultimately, we have the uh, reversibility overlay on top. That's where our uh, Python language personalities would live. Um, and then underneath, we have the underlying debugger and the target process. 
So as I said, the generic algorithm for us, if we want to do a reverse of xx, is just go to a previous checkpoint, uh, script C. Uh, and then from script C, we therefore we can scan reverse xxx into script C, followed by yyy. Uh, and we have some small algorithm that's in the paper where we would figure out how many times you have to execute y, 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 are there shortcuts that you can take, next, continue, finish, and so on. Uh, so the details are on the paper. Uh, I want to get on to the transition watch points. So uh, the thing I want to emphasize again is that in some sense we have a, a replay box there uh, sitting there just below that reversibility overlay. So, uh, and that reversibility overlay can control everything inside this box. So we can move backwards and forwards in time, uh, and that reversibility overlay will control this. It has uh, a lot of uh, language agnostic code, and then it has these, uh, these language-specific personalities which understand the syntax of that language, and even extensions of that syntax to add reverse dash and a basic command. So uh, what does that reverse, reversibility overlay do? Well, it can do either of two things. It can pass new debugging commands into the debugger in the replay layer. So that's why we could convert uh, reverse instruction into go back to last checkpoint and go forward so many steps. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, uh, and, and so we, we can insert uh, arbitrary debugging commands into the replay box. And then, of course, we can move backwards and forwards through time using our checkpoints to come to an arbitrary point in time. So here's more or less the punchline. Here's the way that the game is going to be played. Uh, so uh, suppose a process crashes. Uh, it's probably more interesting for us when it's a multi-threaded process. If it's single-threaded, um, the standard tools tend to do fairly well. But now if you have a multi-threaded process and thread B changed some memory and now thread X is having problems, how are you going to find what went wrong? Well, again, as I say, we have a deterministic replay operating in it. Uh, and then on top of that deterministic replay, we can now watch the process timeline where this process is now intended to be a deterministic path. Uh, at some point, we hit an error all the way over on the right. Uh, and now we have to search for what caused it. Well, uh, and each of those X's is a checkpoint. So at step one, we create a checkpoint. Eventually, we go to step two, where we had a checkpoint and then a crash. Uh, and now, we want to, uh, from this diagnosis of where the crash is, where the error, we'll discover what the problem is. Maybe a null a pointer that should be valid became a null pointer. Maybe we had some application graph that should have been connected, and it turns out it's disconnected now. Whatever the reason is, once we see the error, hopefully we can get some clues about what caused the error. Now we'll build some expression that tests for uh, the fault that caused the error. So this expression could be testing, is our graph still connected? It could be as simple as testing, is our pointer still valid, or is it a null pointer? And once we have this expression, we'll now move over, in this case perhaps, to the middle, halfway between the start and just when we crash. And at this midpoint, we'll again test our expression. Maybe is the graph still connected? Over here, apparently, the graph is not connected. So now we need to continue our binary search between here and here. So now we'll go a quarter of the way back, test, and here, presumably, we'll find that the graph is still connected. And so as we continue our binary search, in a logarithmic number of steps, we will come to exactly where the graph became disconnected. And because of the magic of logarithms, we can actually come up to literally the exact assembly instruction where this happened, uh, if we wish to. Um, if it's GDB, you can always uh, step down to assembly. So in the case of GDB, that might actually be useful. So we can come to exactly where the actual fault occurred. So that's the game that's being played. Um, so what were the ideas that made this work? 
We have a binary search in time. At each step in time in this binary search, we can test is our expression a good one or a bad one. Presumably it was good when we started, it was bad when the error occurred, and now in this binary search we'll find exactly when that expression became bad, and that should be the fault that caused the error. Uh, as we said, there's a logarithmic number of evaluations needed, so this is very important. As I said, if you, uh, in principle, GDB can also do expression wash points, but you would never want to use it because there it's a linear number of expression evaluations uh, once after each statement. Um, so it, it works on an arbitrary consistency condition, such as the example I've been giving, is the graph still connected? Uh, and then it also work, ex extends to a multiple uh, number of threads by using deterministic replay. So we can make sure to choose a schedule for the threads, uh, whatever, which is consistent with the original schedule that exhibited the bug. And we do this just by logging certain events. Um, and so finally, I'll just give this uh, small example, which is described in detail in the paper. And there are several other case studies in the paper. So uh, here we see. Uh, Here's the basic program. Uh, at some point, the user has given commands to uh, if SP2 exists, then drop that procedure. If SP1 exists, drop it. Now redefine SP2. Now redefine SP1. So this was an actual bug from MySQL. Uh, and the way it works is that each, uh, for each of these commands, the command could be dispatched to another thread that would do the work. So the bug, I guess, can be made clear. Uh, we, uh, the first step, draw procedure, if exists SP2, that gets dispatched to client one. The job of client one is to drop the procedure SP2. It has to first find the routine. Presumably, it'll hash to find exactly where it is. It'll then free the memory. Uh, meanwhile, client two is already working on uh, later uh, call SP1 down here. Uh, and client two is assuming that we have the new procedure SP2, but because these are happening in parallel, these two threads. In fact, client one was a little slow, uh, and so uh, client one finally drops that procedure, but uh, much later than only when we expected. And so due to the interleaving here, what we find is client two uh, eventually gets down to the middle where uh, where it now wants to make a call to SP2. Here where it says search for SP2. Uh, it searches for SP2, it finds the address just before it got freed, and now that it found the address, it can proceed to use it. It'll call the address, the address of E is, it found it, but that's the address that just got freed. So there's the bug. Uh, and so now, uh, using our system, uh, we had demonstrated that uh, we could easily find this bug. In this case, it was a null pointer. Um, a more complex example of this type of bug that you will see sometimes is instead of a procedure just being dropped and being a null pointer, it could actually be replaced by a different procedure. Um, and now, the game is even more complicated. Now it's not a case of just a null pointer but rather a case that when you call the procedure SP2, do you get the original behavior or do you get the new behavior? And so again, we could use uh, our expression watch points to repeatedly call SP2 and say, see when this behavior changes. And there again, it would tell us what's happening in this multi-threaded program. Uh, so th this would be a typical uh, and even more interesting use case for this type of uh, technology. So, um, as I said, it's, it's based, it came out of our uh, systems work in which we have developed uh, BMTCP, Never, Never Let a Student Labor Project. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, but it provides transparent checkpointing over uh, many useful cases, multi threaded programs, uh, uh, applications with multiple processes, even distributed processes. So, uh, uh, and, and so you can also look that up if you're interested in seeing other applications of this. Uh, good. So are there any questions?
case where the graph gets disconnected and then reconnected and then disconnected? Ah, um, well, not specifically with the graph, but one bug we ran into, there's something called the ABA problem, that maybe you already know it. Uh, it it's exactly that, that issue. Um, yeah, um, th this by itself would not fix that problem. You, you would have to uh, be a little more clever and, and have something to catch that. Can you still do it in logarithmic time? <coughs> the logarithmic time is no problem. Uh, the, the problem, though, is that um, the condition you're looking for, you might have a fault and then the fault fixes itself, and then the fault is created again and then it fixes itself. So as we go through this log and like search, uh, you want to land right between where the fault was created and then the fault fixed itself. Uh, that, that would be the difficulty using this technique. Any other questions? Let me ask one thing. <laughs> so I, maybe I'm missing something, but I understand that you, you too support multi-threaded programs. Yes. And, uh, it, it, you, you, the programmers can go to the checkpoint, checkpoint and we, you know, deterministically reproduce the, the intermediate uh, state. And, 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 and we do that for them under underneath, inside the replay box. So the question is, uh, how do you deterministically reproduce the multi-threaded behavior? Because in some, in some situations, it's very important to, to find that. Um, so again, uh, some of the details uh, are in the paper, but uh, a key thing for us was, uh, so for many of the languages we tested, first of all, they didn't necessarily support multi-threading, but where they do, like GDB, <coughs> GDB also supports scheduler locking. Uh, so what this means is uh, normally in GDB, if you just say step, GDB has two choices. It can uh, step forward on the current thread, or, but it can also allow the, a second thread to run arbitrarily long. When you turn on schedule locking, then, the, then only the current thread will step forward and nothing else. Uh, this feature, schedule locking, is turned off by default in GDB because under certain conditions, it's possible to run into deadlock uh, when you use schedule locking. So it's intended for advanced users only. Any other questions? So maybe, maybe in the similar direction, what do you do if your processors are your own? Uh, do you rely on the underlying bucket to produce that? Or? Um, in, in our case, we will log the I.O. Uh, and so if the program was interactive and read from the keyboard on replay, uh, the program will receive the same key presses that it received originally. It, it, does it, uh, is it supported by your tool or underlying debugger? Um, logging, such a... Yeah, so the, the, logging, uh, the logging would be part of our reversibility overlay up here. It would, uh, so we, will, we control the replay box and we will feed, it, feed events into the replay box as needed. Okay. Uh, 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 yes. I, I don't understand this point. I, I think that, for instance, if you, if you write a file, then you go to D, the file will show. If, for instance, uh, I didn't put the last one. Okay. You write a file, but now, because it makes it exciting. That's the thing. So, on replay, it would overwrite that same file. Uh, so, um, Normally, because it's deterministic, that's acceptable, but that is something that the user would have to be aware of. But I think his point is the original contents will be will, will disappear once it is override, overridden. So, but um, we go back. But when we when we replay, we will rewrite the original contents back into the file because we have deterministic replay. So if you. The original contents from the first run could will be overwritten, we will lose something, but it'll be written back as we move forward in time again. Okay. Let's thank you.